view from the top, a focus on corruption in leadership. Corruption is not just a theft of resources, it's a theft of values. And that's the word from Managing Director of Transparency International, Kerbis de Swat. He joins us now to discuss this issue. And also joining us is Marius Alberts. He's Director of the Risk Advisory Division at Deloitte. Welcome. You're watching Fee from the Top. A very warm welcome to you, gentlemen. And let's just start with the statement that you gave us and that corruption is a theft not only of resources, but a theft of values and a very important statement that you're making there. Just speak to us about what that means for the countries that you operate in. We, we operate in 108 countries around the world and the one thing that we have learned was that whilst we all know the devastating economic defects of corruption, it indeed also deprives societies of its most powerful agent to fight corruption, namely its people. Because if ordinary citizens feel that their leaders, their public officials are skimming off the system, they start to do the same. And that makes all other efforts, the best laws in the world, the best financial controls, all but very ineffective to deal with a problem. Most often people then say, well, it's endemic. Mm. It's part of the culture. There's no such a thing as corruption being part of a culture. Essentially, all people across the world want to live in societies where they are proud of how their leaders act, of how those in the public service serve them, and they will follow those examples. Marius, I want to bring it in here because Kerbis has said something that's really important in that culture. Because sometimes there is a perception sometimes that in some countries, when it comes to doing business, it's just part of the culture. You know, when it comes to corruption, that's what that's what happens. That's how you do business. I think it's a, it's dangerous when we when we talk around corruption to use too broad statements. Just you know, to a broad statement in terms of. Uh, it is happening in the world, it is happening in other countries, it, it's a high cost to business. I think we need to, we need to drill down a bit in terms of, so what, is, what does it actually mean? The United Nations, for example, in some of their research shows that the cost to business in countries is up to 10% in, in terms of corruption. And public sector procurement can be up to 25%. So it is, it is something that has a real and a tangible, and a tangible impact. Let's just talk a little bit about that tangible impact. I want to bring it here to South Africa because one of the things I was saying to you gentlemen before the interview is that there are reports that are saying that when it comes to cost to GDP here in South Africa, we're talk looking at 20% and you were saying it's really important to not just quantify these numbers, but to actually drill down and to say, these are where the problems are, not just say, well, this is just a D GDP mm -hmm. and let's leave it there, but to drill into these numbers and to say, where are the actual problems and how can you speak to that? I think the one thing that we need to understand is, is it is one issue to talk around the numbers, but it's also important to talk around all the different role players that, that have a role in terms of anti-corruption. It's one thing to have a survey, but as Kuebus rightly said earlier on, it is something that impacts on values, it's something that impacts on business, and for us to do something around anti-corruption, it is critical for all the different role players to be involved. So it's in terms of uh, business needs to get involved, government needs to get involved, civil society needs to get involved, NGOs need to get involved. Kovas, I want to ask you, how, how, with Transparency International, how do you come by these rankings? Because then you'll find, okay, well, South Africa is here, and then it's dropped or it's gone, it's gone up, and that's all the countries that you survey. What is the criteria that you actually use? Well, for our Corruption Perception Index, uh, which covers about 160 countries around the world, we use research not conducted by TI, but by research institutions across the world. Uh, so that particular index is a composite of survey work done across the world. Uh, what is important to note there may be two things. One is that that is a snapshot of how the public service are perceived to be corrupt or clean in a country. And that's a very important indicator. Some of our other work focus on the business community. That's very important too. But what happens in the public sector is usually quite indicative of where the country is going. If I may add to what Marius said about South Africa, interesting, I arrive in the country on Sunday, Monday morning, I switch on my TV before I 
come to the conference and I see the finance minister on television and he says, and we're going to tackle public procurement because we believe there's a real big problem. So I say, wow, I like that because clearly any country has got scarce resources. A country like our own that not only has scarce resources but has massive unemployment, big social inequalities, it is particularly important that all money, the little we have, are spent well. And public procurement, if you get that right, you can make very big savings. So I think that's a, a great focus and we'll be looking with, with great interest how the minister is going to implement uh, this new measures that he announced on, on Monday morning. Maurice, for me what was really interesting is what you said. You say when you look at South Africa, we've got about 14 agencies that are, that are dealing with, with, with this issue and tackling these issues. The legislation is there. It, it's in place. So mm. where is the disconnect? I think the disconnect is, is, is in, in terms of what I said earlier on. I think there's a tendency, they are, we have 14 agencies and that's great. And we have a legislation and that's great. But it's not only the 14 agencies problem and it's not only the legislation, it's not, it's not the only way to solve this. So we have them, they need to do what they are supposed to do and I think they, those agencies need to work on public trust. But then in addition to these agencies, it is civil society, the NGOs and business that needs to get involved. It's all of our problem. It's not only a government problem and it's not only an agency problem. When you say it is all of our problem, I would, I would like you to, to speak to us about, because you were saying that there are some initiatives that Deloitte has now gotten involved in. Just speak to us about some of what you are doing. One of the things that we've done is we've entered into a partnership with the Anti-Corruption Center for Education and Research at the University of Stellenbosch. Gavin Woods heads that up. And we have a partnership where we say that we need to have a solutions-driven uh, setup in terms of anti-corruption. It's one thing to have theoretical discussions around it, but what can we do in the different communi communities to solve that? You, you were wanting to say something on the back of that. Yeah, I, I think it's very interesting when you look at the various agencies. And uh, fighting corruption is very complex and very simple. The simple part is that basically across the world we see very similar patterns. So yes, you need to have the agencies in place, you need to have the laws, the various systems. That's an important part. Financial control being critical. That's one part. The second part that's often overlooked is that you need to have efficiency, management efficiency in the system. Because uh, in most sectors where we see high levels of corruption, it goes hand in hand with management inefficiency. That creates opportunities uh, in the system for corruption. And thirdly, and from a civil society perspective, of critical importance, you need to have public accountability. And I think that is where uh, we arguably live in the most exciting time around the world in the battle of fighting corruption. 20 years ago, people said, it's impossible, you cannot do it. 10 years ago, people said, well, we now have the laws, but it's not really working. Now, particularly in the wake of the Arab Spring, the Indian Summer, uh, Occupy Wall Street, we see a fundamental change occurring where it's no longer that ordinary citizens are happy enough with democracy as a vote to the right to go and vote. We're speaking truth to power. It's now saying, that's not enough. Mm -hmm. We expect power to speak the truth to us. The, the thing that was central to the financial crisis was the lack of integrity, yes. the lack of public accountability. What was central to the protests around the Arab world was saying we've had enough of leaders operating in the shade. We want public accountability to us. Our research worldwide shows that whilst forensic auditing, all of those are necessary and essential, by just opening it up for the ordinary citizens to be able to see what's going on, that public accountability can make a massive difference literally overnight. Maurice, I want to ask you, because you, you were saying, I mean, this trust is, issue is so big, and, and Kobus has talked about the public having trust in the system and the public having trust in their leaders. Just talk to us a little bit. I would imagine it's the same for business. 
having that same trust and that it being just as important for business to have trust in the system, not only when it comes to business having trust in the public sector, but also business having, having trust amongst each other. Absolutely, and also for business to be trusted. Because if you look at this anti-corruption environment, it's not only a public sector issue. Within that relationship, within that social network, that corrupt social network, I mean, business is, a, is, 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 is one of the core players to the extent that if you talk around paying a bribe, somebody has to accept the bribe and somebody has to pay the bribe. So business has a big role in terms of creating their own trust to the extent that they are trusted and that they are a role player in this. Here's what I think mm. was really interesting in just, in just reading some of the research and some of the reports that are coming out. And, and I say this to you, that corruption is not just an emerging uh, con uh, economy problem, but also that in some, in some economies, what you're finding is that if you were to say, well, this country is, and it's a developing country, there is corrupt practices that are happening there and it's endemic. But some of the companies that are going into these countries and paying these bribes are coming from developed economies. So, so where, where do you say, well, we do have to work together, there does have to be a collaboration to deal with this problem? Well, I think uh, one of the great kind of urban myths about corruption is that it's a problem of the South, of developing economies. Uh, if there's one thing that is absolutely uh, to be always stressed is corruption is a global phenomenon. And if you were to separate, although it's very difficult to do it, but conceptually separate international corruption, corruption dr being driven through the international financial system and financial markets and uh, international trade from national level and often more petty mm. level corruption. Tackling international corruption is relatively easy. And it's a lack of political will that have undermined that. We see an excellent example of that in the way OECD countries, the rich countries of the world, have dealt with one of the outfalls of the financial crisis, namely their uh, inability to raise sufficient tax for what their economies needed. And suddenly they started to focus on tax evasion uh, in a major way. That's in the same way that in when the financial crisis broke, we as TI, two years before it happened, said that the greatest threat to tackling corruption worldwide didn't sit in Johannesburg or Addis Ababa or Dhaka in Bangladesh, said in London and New York. Because those were the centers where you had a lot of the financial transactions facilitated through those centers. And that is a moral uh, issue as well, because it is often countries in the north that look at the south and say, you know, you, you've got problems, we expect good governance from you. Good governance is particularly also important when you look at the international financial system. And there, I think the G20 have taken some steps but from our point of view, by far not enough. And this is not something that you need 20 years to sort out. If the political will is there from G20 countries, including South Africa, major advances can be made relatively simple. If you just think about it, the financial outflows of the so-called developing world to the so-called developed world dwarfs the amount of aid money coming into the developing world by a factor of one to a hundred. And a lot of that money that flows out are money that should never be accepted into banks in Europe and elsewhere around the world. Gentlemen, a very interesting discussion, a very important discussion. We're going to take a short break and when we come back we will continue.